ways in which we can be improving on that important mission that we have to deliver uh, to our residents. We're going to talk about new technology um, and innovative uh, programs that are bringing the police and the community uh, closer together. Um, in my own town of Chicago, uh, we have seen significant across-the-board decreases uh, in crime as we've shifted away from a law enforcement first and only strategy. Um, to be short, what we have done is looked holistically at the challenges of public safety, not just the manifestations of it, but looking at the root causes, which requires us to bring a lot of additional resources um, to the table to help uh, strengthen and support uh, safe and vibrant uh, communities. Uh, we have brought uh, city agencies like our libraries, our schools, um, our parks, our public health department, and our infrastructure departments, working in partnership, of course, uh, with our police department to make sure that we're doing everything we can to focus on those communities that are most at risk. And then in addition to that, we are really doing a lot more collaboration with community partners. I'm happy to report that as a result of those efforts uh, over the course of our summer months, we saw historic declines in violence. Now, the reality is um, we're not taking a victory lap. We can't. When we have communities that continue to be plagued by violence, when we have children um, that are losing their lives as a result of violence, none of us can be happy until we're the safest big city um, in, in the country, and that is uh, the effort that we're working on. But I'm happy to be joined this morning um, by a number of leaders um, in public safety uh, who are going to talk to us about some of the challenges uh, that they have faced and the innovative ways in which they've done that. And let me do find my card so I can do this properly. Um, we have with us uh, Greg Fisher, the mayor of Louisville, Kentucky, and the vice chair of our conference. Uh, we also have our host, um, Mayor M Miro Bowser of Washington, D.C., <clears throat> Mayor Kate uh, Gallego from Phoenix, Arizona, and Mayor Jane Castor uh, from Tampa. And I just have to say a moment about <clears throat> uh, Mayor uh, Castor. Some of you know um, she comes from a law enforcement background, worked her way through uh, the Tampa uh, uh, Police Department, and became in 2009 the first woman and first member of the LGBTQ community ever to be chief um, of the Tampa Police Department. And now she serves her community as mayor. Now, in addition to these mayors, we also have Chuck Ramsey, a native of my own city, and we still claim Chuck in Chicago, um, who's become a national leader in public safety, served as uh, chief of uh, Washington, D.C., and then on to Philadelphia, and has an, been an advisor uh, to the Conference of Mayors. And last but not least, we have from uh, Verizon, uh, Senior Vice President for State and Local Government Affairs, uh, Linda Pulley. Uh, it's great uh, to have all of you here, and I think we're just going to dive into uh, the conversation. I'll let the, uh, the speakers introduce themselves, but let's kind of just get started. And I'm going to start with Mayor Fisher. Y you have something called the Synergy Project in Louisville. Tell us a little bit about that and some of the other challenges that you've faced and, and how you've um, come up with innovative solutions to address uh, uh, public safety. Okay, well, thank you, Mayor, so much, and thanks to Verizon for putting this along, and thanks for everybody being at the Conference of Mayors. Uh, I've been mayor of Louisville now for nine years, and if you've been mayor probably nine hours or nine days or nine years, you know how hard it is to create safer cities and all of the different factors we have to play. So the technology I want to talk about here briefly is the technology that's been around a really long time, and that is the human brain and the human heart. Uh, because to fundamentally create safer cities, we have to reorient the way that we live with each other and the way that we look at each other and the opportunities that we create. Uh, first off, I'm a business guy that just happens to be mayor, and the thing that struck me about crime, violent crime in particular, is how much celebration or despondence goes on over single acts of crime. Uh, that when you take a look in most of all of our cities, unfortunately, we can probably predict with a pretty good sense of accuracy how many homicides are going to take place next year in our city. It's going to be, in our case, it's going to be somewhere between 55 and 90. If it's uh, accurate with the last 20 years' worth of data and we have a system in place, if you will, that results in a certain amount of violence in our city. Uh, but our society is geared toward not thinking that way, not geared toward changing systems, but just kind of, we did better this year, we did worse last year, and we're just celebrating this kind of variation that goes on. So the first thing uh, that I did when I became mayor, 
frankly, I didn't have to pay that much attention to violent <laughs> crime because we didn't have that much violent crime. Uh, then the opioid crisis uh, came into our part of the country, and I believe that infusion of opioids led to the doubling or so of the size of the illegal narcotics uh, in our city, which then leads to turf battles and fights, this type of thing. So strangely, we now probably have two to three times more focus on violent crime in our city with worse results than when I started as mayor than when we didn't have that much focus on it. So that's a long way of saying if you're working really hard on this and you've got a systems view, you know, don't get discouraged. There's a lot of things that happen outside of our control. But what was important when citizens would ask to me, what is going on? Why has, been there, why has there been this increase in homicides? The second thing is, and what are you doing about it, Mayor? Because you know it's our fault. And then the third thing that I hope good citizens asked was, and how can I help? And I think our job, one of our jobs as mayors, is to be, have an answer to that question, how can I help? Mm -hmm. Because creating safe cities, peaceful cities, is a co-production of effort. Everybody has got to be involved. So we created a six-pillar system of violence reduction, peace building, where everybody can fit in and knows where they can fit in. So that, you know, the first is what most people think about when they think about bu building a, uh, a safer city, and that's the police. It's the police's job on this. Well, the police is just one part of the pillar. So our first pillar is enforcement. The second pillar is intervention. The third pillar is prevention. The fourth is community mobilization. The fifth is organizational change, and the sixth is reentry. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as the morning goes on. So that's kind of a system thing. But then I would say you have to overlap that with the community that cares about each other. And the mayor has to embrace the secular pulpit that we have to talk about and celebrate the interdependence that we have on each other. In our case, it's our city value of compassion, which means we respect every citizen so their full human potential is flourishing. It's hard for your potential to be flourishing if you're injured or if you're dead. So how do we get in the way of all of this? So building the capacity so people don't turn to crime is a big part of this six-pillar strategy. Everybody in our communities has the potential to be greatness, to be great. But so many of us were not born in situations that engender greatness. I, my wife and I just had our first grandchild two months ago, and she has everything. She's got loving parents, grandparents, everything she needs. And it is just put in a profound, stark difference to me, reminds me again, is why don't every kid have that? And how, if we as mayors are successful in that effort, there's going to be a lot less discussion about violent crime reduction in our communities. So that involves then getting to the root cause of so much of the crime in our community. And that, of course, is poverty. People do not turn mm -hmm. to, most people turn to guns and dealing drugs or whatever it might be is because they need money to survive. What if we had a country where everybody had their basics taken care of in terms of a living wage, in terms of housing, in terms of health care, in terms of food? So it's good that we have panels like this, but until we fundamentally reorganize our responsibilities to each other in this country where we can provide people with the basics, we're going to continue to have these type of issues because it's just the nature of people needing to survive. And it's unfortunate that so many people turn to, turn to crime to do that. So we have to be real about what the root causes of poverty are. We have to be truth tellers as mayors. We have to get into the ugly underbelly of racism, of the history of slavery in our country, so that people can understand why so much of this poverty is with us today, and then we need to do something about it. That, to me, ultimately, is how we're going to really solve this problem. That's great. So, Mayor Bowser, um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing um, in Washington, D.C., and particularly what you're doing to empower uh, people in their neighborhoods. Thank you so much, Mayor, and I, I want to thank you for your leadership on this important issue, uh, and uh, thank you for taking on uh, this very important committee at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, and as we, uh, you'll likely hear from all the mayors, uh, the sentiment that Mayor Fisher just evoked. 
uh, that public safety and solving the problems of public safety are not just the job uh, of the police. Uh, but in our administration, we take the approach that every department, every person that works for D.C. government uh, has a role to play in making our community safer and stronger. Uh, I am paneled a, a commission of my directors. Uh, we call them the Safer, Stronger Commission. Uh, it was led by two doctors who work for me, one who is the chief medical examiner and one who is the director of health. Uh, and the, the, our point in putting them in charge of a Safer, Stronger Committee that brought in the police, brought in violence interrupters, brought in our human services agencies was to send home the point that we won't solve uh, issues of violence in, in communities without taking a full bore and across uh, agency approach. And we are very pleased with a number of the recommendations they brought out. Uh, but I want to focus on uh, how we are giving our police department, which we are very proud of, and we have a former chief of the Metropolitan Police, who we claim as well, uh, Chief Ramsey, uh, who focus very much on how we professionalize our police department, give them the tools that they need to do their work, but most importantly, give them the tools that they need to maintain a very delicate balance that we are proud of in Washington, D.C., and that is the balance between policing and community relations. Um, because what we know, uh, what we all know, uh, is that we are that one bad incident away um, at any given day uh, from there being a, a problem with police and communities. Communities can't uh, be safe and strong without uh, police officers who are committed to constitutional policing, and police can't do their jobs uh, without communities that trust them uh, to do the right thing and trust them for holding bad guys accountable and letting good guys live their lives in peace. So that balance uh, is very important to us. So I just wanted to mention a few of the tools that we've put in place in the last five years um, that helps us get there. Uh, and that's the body-worn camera. Uh, you will hear a lot of folks talk about body-worn camera. I'm very proud that in 2016, our force uh, had the largest deployment of body-worn camera in the country. Um, our front-facing police officers, our, all our patrol officers, uh, were equipped with body-worn camera. Over 3,000 are out in the field now. Uh, we had the thought uh, that we were going to, with this deployment, test uh, how it would work. So our first phase uh, included half of our officers getting the body-worn camera uh, and the second half of the patrol officers uh, going with the status quo. Uh, and I employed one of our, uh, one of our groups uh, in the city that I call the lab at D.C., which are social scientists, to study um, that study period. And we're happy uh, to share that information. Uh, what we learned uh, was that body-worn camera helps our officers be accountable and community members be accountable and are very helpful if there's ever a dispute in who said or did what uh, in that case. We also learned, however, that it is not a replacement uh, for good recruitment, a professionalized force, for hiring people who are committed to constitutional policing and making sure those who are not don't work for us at MPD. Uh, so I just want to, it is a good tool, but it's not the end-all, be-all. The second thing that we deployed uh, is called our private security camera. Uh, what what all the mayors will tell you is that when there's violence in the neighborhood, not only do people want to know what the police are doing, they want to know if there's something else that they can do uh, to keep their families and businesses safer. Uh, so one tool that we employed was saying, community member, you go out there and you buy a private security camera. They're much better now. Uh, the quality is very good for a, a, a small price. And we'll give you a rebate. We're not going to make it complicated. We're not going to make it hard. We'll give you $200 per camera with a $500 uh, maximum. And you know what? 
people did it. Uh, we promised them it would only take you 45 days to get th get your money back. Uh, and to date, we have uh, deployed 17,000 cameras and spent $2.5 million. And communities feel empowered um, that they are just not going to be a victim to crime, but they are going to uh, be a part of the solution. The last thing I'll mention is our CCTV cameras, and those are close uh, circuit cameras. Um, Chief Ramsey may remember when we first deployed cameras in the city it was a huge controversy because nobody had cameras then and nobody wanted to be monitored by the government and it was the sense of how are we going to make sure only the right people uh, have access to those cameras. They were very expensive. They didn't work that well and over the years that technology uh, has improved. Uh, and just la at the end of last year uh, I announced with the Chief of Police that we're going to have a regular replacement schedule. We're going to um, increase our capacity by about 75 percent uh, so that we have access to that. And what is that all about? Not that we want to monitor our residents. We don't. Um, but we do want to deter crime and we want our officers to have the tools that they need if a crime occurs to close it. There's nothing uh, that I emphasize to our police more is that if somebody dies in our community at the hands of violence, someone has to be held accountable. Uh, and we use that video footage uh, in those cases uh, to make uh, cases and to make sure uh, that we're deterring that violence and that there's, that there's certain uh, justice. Uh, and the last thing I'll say, Mayor, uh, is that the public knowing that we are doing the right things with those tools uh, is very important. Um, so a legislative framework to support uh, how the footage would be used uh, and when, for example, with body-worn camera, uh, it can be released to the public so that the public knows what's happened and knows that the, the government and the police are not trying to hide anything from the public um, when we're working on very delicate issues of police and community relations. And, and Mayor, we, we, can, we can actually help you with that because we rolled out a policy uh, back in 2016 that I helped draft um, that now is implemented all things being equal, our um, uh, footage, initial police reports, audio, and cameras, dash cam, mm -hmm. um, and body cam are out within 60 days. And we're happy to share that policy. Thank you. With Thank you, you Mayor. Yeah. So now can we hear from uh, Mayor Castor? All right. I'm going to try to talk very, very fast because we have five minutes and I could talk forever <laughs> about this. So I'm going to be pretty pragmatic about this. Uh, uh, we were, in 2002, 2003, Tampa was one of the most dangerous cities for our size, had one of the highest crime rates, and now we are one of the safest cities uh, our size in the nation. One of the things that we did was change the way that we police. And anybody that has been a part of organizational change knows that is one of the most difficult things. You'll, people do not like change. If they say they do, they're either a liar or what they mean is I like change for them, don't change my world. <laughs> And the people that are the most resistant to that are police officers. Actually, the most resistant are firefighters. Police officers come second. Whereas Ron, Ron L. Surpass would put it, uh, firefighting, 200 years of tradition, unimpeded by change. Um, so what we did is we focused, and it's focus on four, on four crimes, crimes that happen in large enough numbers, and they lend themselves to enforcement. And so that was robberies auto burglaries, auto theft, and residential burglaries. By focusing on those, it had a ripple effect. Crime is categorized in part one and part two crimes, and we had a reduction in each of those categories every single year since 2003. Certainly not a simple thing. One of the things that we did is met with the community and find out what they needed. As police officers, we think we know what everybody needs, and that's to be protected from rapists, robbers, and murderers, which is true, but very few people are victims of those kinds of crimes. When you talk to them, what they say is, I don't want people taking my stuff. And so we were able to reduce a lot of those property crimes, which again had a ripple effect on the violent crime uh, as well. And we are at a point now, actually we were at this point seven years ago, where our officers self-initiated calls outnumbered the calls for service. 
And so that working relationship with the community, knowing that the community has a responsibility for the crime rate more so than the officers. I used to say we have close to 500,000 people in the city of Tampa, 1,000 police officers. You're going to keep crime out of your neighborhood with our help, not the other way around. I'll give you one of the um, examples and looking at the data, when you go back, you talk to your police chief, ask them what the crime stats are. If they can't roll them off, you've got a problem. So that is what they need to be focusing on is the crime rate and the uh, reduction of crime in their, their uh, city. Again, we analyzed everything, incredibly data-driven uh, in our department. And that's another thing, too. You've got to have analysts. So our auto theft, we were at one point leading the nation in auto thefts. Um, we focused on, which is the same thing for most cities, it's juveniles that are stealing cars. Right. So we focused on that. We went from having just under 7,000 cars stolen a year in 2002 down under uh, 400 by the time I left in, in uh, 2015. And they've actually reduced it further, over 92% reduction in auto theft. And that is by focusing on juveniles who are stealing cars. We would send uh, juveniles, I don't know what it is in other states, ours, they get put on sanctions as opposed to probation. One of those sanctions is a curfew. Juvenile probation officers don't work past five in the afternoon, so even I was smart enough to figure that one out. <laughs> so we send police officers out to do the juvenile checks to make sure that they're home. You can imagine how excited they were at the possibility <laughs> of being able to do that. But, you know, you say you want to investigate 10 auto burglaries tomorrow, or do you want to go make sure the kid's at home this evening? Also, by visiting the, ho the home, they get to see who the caregivers are, what service provisions they need within that home, all of the things that you can, those wraparound services, so you can make that family whole. It had a profound effect in reducing auto thefts, but also not only those kids stop stealing cars, but now their siblings don't get involved in crime as well. Juveniles don't commit the majority of crime, but particular juveniles can literally be a walking crime wave. So that's one of the areas that we focused on. We also hit sort of a plateau at one point. And so um, I saw a renowned uh, crime fighter, not Chuck Ramsey. Chuck Ramsey is a god of law enforcement in case <laughs> nobody knows that. But uh, anyway, the author of Broken Windows, and somebody said, what, what is the broken windows of today? And he said, the person that can bring the information together, the, the victim has a piece of the information, law enforcement has a piece of the information, suspect has a piece of the information. Whoever can bring that together will be successful in reducing crime moving forward. So we at the Tampa Police Department basically developed our own software. We developed the business principles, and then had a software company um, develop that, and it's called Street Smart. It's three components to it. One of it is a living crime map, where once a crime is validated between the dispatch and the records management, it's on that map, so officers have a real-time idea of crime in their community. Another one is it's a living blog. Officers put notes on their notepad, put it in their back pocket, and go home. Now it's, it's loaded down into a searchable blog. So officers, again, you can put a red truck in, and it comes up every time that, that particular uh, truck was mentioned. So it gives them, again, a real-time idea of what's happening in their area of responsibility in the whole city. Another one are bulletins. Some place gets robbed. Historically, uh, that would be referred to a detective. Detective would come out five or six days later and make up a bulletin and distribute that bulletin. Now officers go in with their smartphones, they take a photograph, go out to their uh, cruiser and make up a bulletin and put it out in real time. So we catch the guy walking down the street. And a lot of that is just that rapid response to crime, rapid response. You can't write it up and refer it because somebody's going to do 10 other crimes by the time the detective gets out there. So we task our officers with being investigators, not reporters, and investigating from the time it happens all the way through uh, to the crime. And the things that warm chiefs' hearts more than anything is when you can solve a crime 
catch a burglar, return the property to the owner before they even know they were a victim of crime. So those are the kind of things that you look at. But it is not easy. Go on to tampagov.net, look at Focus on Four. Um, people will say, well, we're going to steal your ideas. I'm like, well, I stole them from somebody else first. So, uh, you know, my best original ideas come from other people. And I will help in any way that I can um, with crime issues or uh, anything else that you have. So feel free to reach out. So, so Mayor Castor is a former federal prosecutor. I feel like you just sang me a love song. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Now uh, we'll turn to uh, Phoenix with uh, Mayor Gallego. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Thank you to Mayor Lightfoot and, and all the panelists for your leadership on these important issues. I am Kate Gallego, the mayor of Phoenix. Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the United States and fastest growing. But I got a strong reminder today that I am the second most famous, in my, famous mayor in my college class, uh, Mayor Pete vastly eclipsing me <laughs> <laughs> in that area. In uh, Phoenix, it, it has been a rough week for us in Phoenix. I am the mother of a three-year-old, and that's very, very important to me. Um, earlier this week, we had a woman who had recently moved to our community from Oklahoma who killed three of her children under age three. Um, she sang, sang to them as she smothered them. And that is heartbreaking for anyone involved, but particularly difficult for our first responders, everyone from police to fire to the crime teen techs. Uh, many of them were also parents of young children, and it's really, really hard to, to go through something like that. Uh, we are trying to invest in mental health support for our first responders and really making sure that they have more counseling, more resources, time off, and that we try to change the culture and talk about this is a stressful, tough job and that you ought to be able to talk about it. Uh, we are also trying to look just generally at, at mental health in our community. Uh, very recently, we led the country in officer-involved shootings, and that's something I've said I really want to take a hard look at. Somewhere between 25% and 50% of officer-involved shootings involve severe, usually undiagnosed mental illness, and we're putting a lot of resources in that area in Phoenix. We've started deploying clinicians with our first responders to address some of the issues, as well as partnering with caseworkers. Uh, we've had individuals who in one month have generated 45 calls for service, so a huge amount of resources. Mm -hmm. And we wanna make sure we have clinicians there to help solve the issue, as opposed to asking our police officers to manage it. We are also investing in better training for our officers, and that's on everything from some of the schizophrenia and issues that you see often all the way through dementia. About 80% of dementia patients are treated at home, so our first responders are often the people who are addressing that and treating it. Uh, I learned, I, I had lost my grandmother last year to dementia-related causes. And a wonderful woman, a great mentor to me who really helped me through some of the difficult times in my life. I didn't know a lot about dementia and towards her end of life, her personality really changed. She was often aggressive. It was not the grandmother who I knew. And our first responders have encountered that as well. So we've uh, done great partnerships with our university and nonprofits to try to get both our police officers and firefighters training so that they understand what they're seeing and, and how to appropriately respond. We have invested in virtual reality training and, uh, and created scenarios uh, with people experiencing schizophrenia and other um, similar responses and let our officers get that very, very realistic training. Uh, they did want to test it on the mayor, and I'm not Mayor Caster, so <laughs> those, are, those are tough scenarios, and, and it was good for me as well to understand how difficult that it is to know how to respond in those situations to make sure that everyone goes home safely. So that's been a, a, a good tool for us. Uh, we've partnered with some of our mental health agencies, and they've worked with us. To, to find individuals who've experienced mental illness to come in and talk with our police officers, to answer questions, and to really give a, a firsthand look at why these situations 
are so complicated. Um, so we had uh, one man come in who talked about he, he often would not take his medication and our officers asked why. And he said, when I take that medication, I can't have sex with my wife. And we had a bunch of 22 year olds there who were nodding and saying, oh, I, I see why you might make that decision. And that really built some empathy and, and helped both sides see these are very, very difficult issues. So really trying to put a face on it so that the first time our officers are in this situation, it's not out in the field and we can try to address these solutions. Another program that I'm very proud of is our compliance assistance program, which helps individuals who are in our court system and have been unable to pay fines and fees. Uh, before I was elected, we had thousands and thousands of people driving on suspended licenses. We had officers who would arrest the same person three times for a suspended license. They would then get more and more fees that they couldn't pay. If you cannot pay your ticket while you have your driver's license, if you take it away, that makes it even more difficult. So we did a lot of, of reform. We had previously pushed people to max out their credit cards to pay their fees. And many people, it just wasn't realistic if you're choosing between medication or food for your kids and paying off your fines. Not surprisingly, many people chose to just ignore the fines. We had $283 million in unpaid fines. Uh, we actually had to reinforce the records building because it was so heavy uh, with ancient records that um, the building had structural challenges. So not a win for anyone. But when we brought the, we did reform around that and allowed people to have a realistic payment plan, we got rid of some of the late payment fees. We then got a much, much higher level of compliance. We saved our taxpayers millions of dollars and when people got their driver's license back, it in many cases was a huge benefit to them. We had one woman who left a domestic violence situation be when she got her driver's license back. Was a, uh, we many, many people who got higher paid jobs. Employers paid less to people who didn't have a driver's license available. And we don't have to keep arresting people for suspended license. So that's been a great one and has really helped us build trust with our community. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and now I'm going to turn to uh, to Chuck Ramsey. Um, the, the accolades of, of are well deserved, but Chuck, why don't you give us uh, your perspective on uh, some of the innovative things that you're seeing uh, mayors do across the country related to public safety? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I've got three examples, two of which uh, center around technology, one around um, uh, good old-fashioned uh, training, uh, but this training would also lend itself. Uh, to uh, technology to make it even more effective. The first thing I want to talk about comes from um, my hometown and Mayor Lightfoot's town, and that is Chicago, uh, the Strategic Decision Support Centers. Now, many departments uh, had or have real-time crime centers. These are like an operations command where uh, information, it comes in in real time. Uh, you kind of know what's going on. You see trends. You see patterns. You see all this sort of thing. Chicago took it a step further and decentralized that into some of the uh, heavy crime districts. It started in 2017 in two districts that I'm very familiar with, one on the south side of Chicago, the 7th District, which covers the Inglewood community. I know it because I grew up there. Uh, the second is the 11th District on the west side of Chicago. I know that one because I was the commander of that district for three years uh, in the late 80s. Um, and uh, those are two districts that historically have high levels of violence, particularly shootings, homicide, you know, gang activity, and so forth. Give you an example, when I was commander of 11th District, and 11th District's only six and a half square miles. One year, we had more than 100 murders in that district. 6.5 square miles, much of that vacant land that was burned down during the riots in 68 and had not yet been rebuilt. But that was the intensity of the violence there. And what they did was they created these many command centers, which they call strategic de decision support centers, that get the real-time information for that district to really be able to make critical decisions around deployment, around a, a variety of things, to really see what's going on. The Rand Corporation did a study on the uh, system and found that it did have an impact 
on crime, and I think the numbers uh, reflect that. It's since, I think, expanded to another 13 or so districts right. uh, in the city. But it's something to think about because it does take that technology. And the bigger the city, probably the more important that is because in, in a city like Philly, for an example, a large city, real-time crime center, which we had a lot of information being put, but it's like it, it's a lot of stuff. It's overwhelming because it's citywide. If you take it down to the district level, it, it, it's, it's, it's more manageable, um, and you can make, I think, faster and better decisions. So that, that's one, and I'm certain that Mayor Lightfoot would provide more information. The other, uh, Mayor Gallego uh, from Phoenix uh, touched on it, and that's virtual reality training. That is the trend now, um, is to put officers in scenarios as opposed to just uh, uh, the, you know, the old style uh, training of somebody standing in front, you know, just giving you a lecture or you go to firearms practice and you shoot at a target, but there's no judgment, no decision making, none of that took place. Virtual reality changes that dynamic and really focuses on judgment of the officers. I saw a software, I was at a conference and this may be similar to what you, you mentioned, uh, Mayor, I, I don't know. But I went through it, and what I liked about it was it gave you the perspective from the police officer when you come across a situation where you've got a person going through a mental health crisis. In this case, it was schizophrenia. But then it also put you in the position of being the person going through mm -hmm. that particular crisis. Mm -hmm. And it actually had sound, and it had the words, you could hear the words of the thoughts that were going through that person's mind at the time they were being confronted by police. It gave you a totally different perspective of what's going on when you had come across these particular situations. It was absolutely fascinating. And it also, uh, it reacted to your actions, the commands you gave as a police officer that prompted a, a reaction from the individual going through the mental health crisis. And so if you were on a de-escalation path, the de-escalation was shown to have an impact. But if your actions were such that you were either, and a lot of times you're escalating, you may not be trying to, but you are, then obviously it would take a whole different track. In other words, that is incredible training that I think uh, is only going to get better as time goes on. The last one I want to use as an example, as, it, as of now, is just going to be regular uh, training, although it will be scenario-based and, and uh, exercises and so forth, but it would lend itself to reality-based training. And that's something that the Police Executive Research Forum recently came up with, and they just had a publication I read uh, just a couple weeks ago, and they're going to push this training out for departments uh, this spring, I believe it's this spring. But it's, it deals with the issue and the phenomenon of suicide by cop, where you have people going through a mental health crisis. Uh, they, for whatever reason, aren't willing to take their own life, but want somebody else to do it for them. That is not uncommon. There was a study that between 2015 and 2018, in the United States, there was an average of between 900 to 1,000 fatal officer-involved shootings. It's estimated that anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of those shootings actually were suicide by cop. Now, that's a huge number when you stop and you think about it. And could that have been avoided? Could it have been handled differently so that the outcome would obviously be diff diff different? They also uh, used, and by the way, they put this together with mental health professionals uh, and others. So it, it's, it's something that really has been... Um, put through the ringer by people who really understand this. But they also use an example the Los Angeles Police Department. They have a unit called the Mental Evaluation Unit. There aren't many departments that track what they believe to be fatal shootings or incidents involving what would have been suicide by cop. may not have turned out to be a fatal shooting, but it was suicide by cop. And to give you an example, uh, in L.A., from 2010 to 2015, they estimate they had 419 suicide by cop cases that officers responded to. Now, they had received training, specific training about de-escalation and dealing with mental health crisis. 341 of those cases were resolved with no force used at all. That's 81 percent. 71 cases, less lethal force was employed. That's taser and things like that. That's 17 percent. 
Of the 419 cases, only seven lethal force was used. That's 2% of the cases that actually resulted in lethal force out of 419. And only one case out of 419 resulted in an officer being injured, which is going to be something that an officer would want to, you know, would want to know about. I mean, that's, that's stunning when you really stop and think about it. And the training that PERF has put together deals with, and if you go to their website, and I can give you the, the, the website, they actually have this report right online. Um, there's specific training for dispatchers when they get to call. What are the right questions to be asking? Because the person on the other end is saying, oh, he's off his medication, or, or he's, you know, uh, uh, saying that he wants, to, he wants to kill himself, blah, blah, blah. There are indicators that would be then transmitted to the responding officers that this is potentially a suicide by cop type <clears throat> of scenario. Then there's training for the officers themselves on what to do, what not to do. Things like a person is going through something like that, the mere fact that you point your gun at them, it's going to be an invitation for that person to run toward the gun because they want to die anyway. Uh, telling a person going through a mental health crisis to calm down is not what they want to hear. <laughs> so there's, there, there, there's ways in which you can communicate, and it all depends on the communication skills, to de-escalate and get the person to a level where you can then talk to them, reason, and you can avoid uh, having to resort to uh, lethal uh, force. Um, and, and I found that to be fascinating. Again, they are going to roll that out soon. Uh, I think that's something that any department would want to at least take a look at because anything we can do to resolve uh, issues short of using force of any kind, in particular deadly force, is something that we need to really pay close attention to. Uh, that's what's happening uh, uh, now. And when I said it would lend itself to virtual reality, I can only imagine if they created the scenarios using virtual reality, putting officers in those scenarios, having them exercise judgment, paying attention to the language that they use. Are you actually de-escalating? Are you making a situation worse? All those kinds of things. And by including dispatchers that oftentimes don't give the officers the full information they need when they're rolling to the scene to know what they're going into is critically important. So it's not just focusing on the cops, it's focusing on the others. Uh, as well, and then uh, what do you do with that information and what kind of services are available uh, that you can provide and take the individual so they can get the proper care um, once the situation is resolved. So uh, those three things I wanted to emphasize. Thank you. That's very helpful information. And last but not least, I want to bring in uh, Lin Linda Pulley from Verizon. Um, yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, very, very honored to be here uh, with the panel of mayors today. And listening to you today just sort of reminds, at least reminds me, that when it comes to public safety, the most in important factor is the human factor. You know, you started with that, Mayor Fisher, and that those pieces you have to get right, right? The collaboration, the, you know, vesting across agencies, the vesting across uh, communities, getting that transparency, that trust, et cetera. The technology, it's a tool but you really have to get the human side right. Um, so what I wanted to talk a little bit about today was sort of the, what, what can be done in real time. So harnessing technology can be, can be difficult, obviously. The technology changes so quickly. And also there's so much data out there. And, and guess what? There's just going to be more and more data um, uh, as, as the technology gets deeper uh, in there. And the question is, how do you harness that in real time? and get it into the hands of um, the first responders and others who really need it. Um, so one particular, you, you may have heard the phrase, uh, cities, cities may be uh, data rich but information poor. You know, so that question is, how do you harness that information? Um, so for example, uh, in the wake of Hurricane Michael, um, there were, you know, obviously uh, counties, cities, uh, towns down in Florida uh, who were, you know, you know, trying to respond to the, to the crisis. And what was uh, found after, um, uh, after the crisis was the, the information was not share, shared. Uh, and so we probably hear that pretty often. So some of the things that have been done there is to put in a, um, a real-time information, information sharing service. So for example, um, the information that can be gathered, whether it's from, um, again, uh, uh, 
traffic cameras, um, gunshot detectors, GPS, all that sort of stuff can be put in real time and different agencies, the police, the sheriffs, maybe even FEMA one day, can see that all together. And so, for example, you could use the traffic cameras to see, oh, look, there, you know, th that intersection is flooded. There's some downed trees, et cetera, et cetera. So that piece, you know, that real time uh, information gathering, harnessing the data that's out there, um, can, you know, can, can share. Um, Chief Ramsey talked a little bit about Chicago um, earlier on. That piece in particular, when we think about, I believe it was Chicago had the largest um, systems of municipal, like, traffic cameras. Mm -hmm. And think about that, all that being fed into the one system, at, you know, as well as with, again, the other <laughs> items that I mentioned before. The, that tremendous, uh, you know, drop in crime, as Chief Ramsey said, district by district, has just been, um, you know, a real story and success. And again, it's how do you get that real-time information um, out to the, you know, out to the first responders. Um, there are also places, obviously, where um, it doesn't have to be real time. Again, we talked a little bit about the virtual reality, that training. Um, that is particularly effective, as again, as Chief Ramsey uh, mentioned earlier, but also, for example, on the Vision Zero. So that, that those types of cameras at given intersections, the sorts of data, not just cameras, but also um, uh, uh, other types of monitors gather so much information, and then you can get the analytics from uh, from that information, study it, give it to the engineers, give it to the city planners. So, what can be done to improve the safety of that particular um, intersection? Um, so, just a couple other things I wanted to to highlight as well. So, uh, here in D.C. Um, with, uh, with uh, Mayor Bowser's help, we have a 5G responders lab. And what's really cool there is um, companies that are building new tools can come into these labs, have the technology, the, the 5G technology, which will, uh, again, enable so much more data to come in in real time, no latency. And they are there building the tools. And some of the, some of the, the whiz-bang things that you see there you just, you imagine them in the hands of uh, public safety and it's just tremendous. So for example, um, there's, a, there's a camera um, for firefighters uh, that allow the, allows them to go in, in the dark, in smoke field, filled rooms, uh, you know, and see. So it's, it's, like, a, it's like night vision, um, but one of the many cool things is all that data is being fed real time uh, you know, back to, you know, I don't know if it's the mm -hmm. command central, yeah. but I love that idea of, I mean, they've literally got your back. You know, they're seeing in real time exactly what you're seeing. So it's that type of innovation that's super, super exciting. Um, another example is um, drones, for example. So back to, um, you know, hurricanes, natural disasters, the drones can fly over, feed real-time data, overlay it onto a map so you can see, again, whether it's the flooding, whether it's, uh, you know, downed lines, all that sort of stuff. But that way, again, the, the responders, the planners, they can see in real time on the maps what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to highlight, you know, particularly as, um, <clears throat> particularly as 5G rolls out further, that's going to enable so much more of this data uh, but then the question is also what tools uh, can be uh, put in the hands of the first responders. So it's an exciting time. So Great. thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to make sure that we uh, save time for, for questions. Let me highlight um, one other, two quick things from Chicago. Um, Chief Ranzi talked about what we call our strategic uh, decision support centers. These are district level um, technology rooms where we brought into uh, those rooms uh, the camera feeds from 
all the surrounding areas, not just from traffic, but also um, public safety cameras, cameras on businesses, and we have technology folks that are trained in those rooms, uh, civilian analysts along with uh, police officers who staff those rooms 24-7 and report out on every roll call about what they've seen, uh, whatever instances are happening, and they have solved crimes in a real-time fashion. Let me give you one example. We had a terrible shooting um, in our downtown area where seemingly a guy randomly rode a bicycle up to a group of people that were going to lunch and targeted a particular woman, shot her, and then sped off on his bike. Within um, a few hours, uh, as a result of the technology, we were able to track him uh, from the north side of our city, literally he traversed almost the entirety down to 63rd Street, that will resonate for Chicago people in here, to his house on the basis of cameras that were on the street, on the, he took a bus, uh, put his bike on, tracked him to um, his house, and within a day, we were able to, to apprehend him. And that is a result of the technology in that room. <laughs> One other thing that I also just want to point out, I'm happy to talk more about this offline. As I said, we're not just focusing on the law enforcement fa uh, facet of public safety, which is critically important. We're also focusing on what can we do to invest in our young people. We know in our city that there's a cohort of 16 to 24 year olds um, who are both at risk to be victims of crime, but also perpetrators of crime. So we started a pilot program last summer that we're going to expand exponentially this summer. We call it the Summer for Change. We took 400 at-risk at youth, we provided them with um, cognitive behavioral therapy, we gave them jobs, um, we um, put them into counseling sessions, and then really focused intensively on them over the course of the summer. In that time, not only did they, we not have anybody who was a victim of crime, we had no, um, no one in that cohort who was a perpetrator of crime, and the results of that lasted over the course of the fall and into this new year. So we, that's just one thing that we're doing to really focus uh, and think creatively about ways in which we can bring other investments to the table that we know are going to make a difference in public safety. And with that, let me um, throw it open for any questions that any of the mayors um, ha have of the panel or any comments that you want to make about experiences in your cities. I have one question about yes, the... Sir. Can, um, you t can you just tell us who you are? Sure. McKinley what? Price, Mayor, Newport News, Virginia. With your increase in cameras, uh, what we've found, too, is that we now have prosecutors who have to spend more time viewing that. Uh, did that add additional resources that you needed to cover that? Well, look, I, I, you know, I, for example, the, the, the example that I gave, um, you know, as a former prosecutor watching the piecing together of the information to target this guy both before he committed the crime, because we got camera information on that, and then after, at the time of the crime, and then showing him literally through the route. There's no more powerful evidence than that as prosecutors, where you're literally handling, handing up the probable cause um, in, on a thumb drive uh, to the prosecutors. And yes, it takes more time, but we've, we are committed to making sure that we devote the resources, not only at the district level, but we've also expanded that technology and the resources into our detective divisions so that they are also part of the technological change that is helping us in crime fighting. We've had, we, those uh, STSC rooms literally will connect with patrol, patrolmen when the shot spotter cameras show something, the cameras focus in, we see the car, we now have um, license plate uh, technology that allows us to see those plates in real time, pass that information out, that has led to a substantial increase in our ability not only to respond but to actually solve crimes. So I think for prosecutors it's a gift because it makes them their job that much easier and they don't have to say, hey, this is great, but we need you to go out and do more. When we come and present the cases now to our local state's attorney, the cases are, um, the, the, the evidence is really there on a platter for them. I'll, I'll add something to that, too. With the body-worn <coughs> cameras, you have to be very intentional about your policy on that. Yep. And I worked with Miami for three years just on their policy. Because if you have a homicide and you have a perimeter set up and you've got ten officers that have their cameras on at all times, they have to watch all of that video. So you have to be very intentional of when those cameras are turned on and when they're turned <coughs> off. If, if I might add, Mayor, and I, I want to associate myself with both of um, the Mayor's comments, 
for body worn camera, just the storage alone and watching those videos and the amount of time it takes, I do think it's uh, appropriate to set community expectations yep. about um, what it takes. When the mayor said it takes 60 days, some, you know, we try to speed it up, but we have to look at all of those things and be able to make sure that the cases that the police and the prosecutors have to make are not harmed by um, the release of, of body worn camera. Um, but I want to say, uh, you asked, does it take more resources? The answer is yes. Um, I took, uh, unfortunately, when we hit a mark of 50 homicides in DC, I, I had a, um, this was like, in my view, was very early in the year, and it marked us needing to be very concerned about the summer months and the later months. I had a meeting with uh, my chief, detectives, command staff, our federal partners to review every single homicide. And what struck me during that meeting was the amount of time that the detectives are using on cameras. Not just ours. We have body-worn camera. We have CCTV. Then you know what we have that we didn't have? A bystander camera. Uh, then every business has a camera. So the, And then sometimes they can't get to the camera. They have to get a court <laughs> order to get to the footage, to get to some cameras. Um, but I like the challenge um, because we want uh, our prosecutors, present company excluded, but some prosecutors, they don't want to do nothing without it. <laughs> So we want to give them everything they need so they're not telling us we can't take this to a jury because they're not going to believe it. So for us, we're unique in the district, of course. Our prosecutors are federal. Our courts are federal. Um, but we want to make sure that our police are buttoning up as much of information as they have. But I was struck by the time it takes where something happens. And sometimes the police have a strong suspect. Um, and they may be zeroed in on, on somebody, but collecting all of the data uh, and all of the camera footage to go with a case is taking more time. I wanted to just share real quickly, this is related to this. Many of us have had a conversation of how quickly do we release video after officer-involved shootings. Mm -hmm. And when I became mayor, it was just, you know, it was this overly complicated process, you know, 30 days, 60 days. You have a most highly emotional officer involved shooting your if your cities are like mine people are very upset and they immediately are thinking we don't trust what's happening this same thing we reduced it to a 24 hour release of the video so we first pulled together a group of uh, very interested community citizens slash activists slash agitators so they can see it right before the press conference takes place and that has diffused so much anxiety and ill will in the community just by doing that, that it lowers the tension, lowers the temperature so we can move forward with keeping our city growing. Right here. Thank you, Mayor Lightfoot and panelists. My name is Deneen Sirachi. I'm the mayor of the city of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, we have, we've been using data to identify what we call our frequent flyers, and I'm, so I'm curious about protocol and best practices from other communities. We've also just hired a police social worker to help us because we are dealing with a lot of mental health issues. Um, so I'm, I'm just any comments about that. And secondly, have any cities uh, on the panel or uh, in the room used a software called CopLogic, which is like a self-report for minor crime uh, so that we're not sending police officers out? And I guess I have one more thing, which is we're having a really hard time recruiting new police officers. Um, we maybe get one out of every 15 applications that goes through and comes out on the other side. And sometimes they want to come work for the city of Lancaster, and sometimes they don't. Um, but any strategies related to police recruitment um, that are especially working for you? We have the, um, the – there's a couple of programs. One is focused deterrence which is very um, personnel intensive, but it's, it's mostly for those individuals that are walking crime waves and they're given an opportunity to get out of a life of crime. They're provided social services, everything else, with the understanding that if they violate again, you know, they're gonna have the book thrown at them. And uh, it's been very successful in the cities that I've worked in since I retired. Um, you know, people will say, nobody's ever offered me a chance in life. And these individuals are just committing, you know, hundreds of crimes. So that's one. Our, our juvenile program was uh, with those where the, you call them frequent flyers, the worst, you know, most prolific offenders. And uh, again, 
nobody had paid any attention, nobody had provided the services that they needed, and then you're helping out those siblings so that they don't turn or don't get involved in a life of crime as well. Recruiting is, um, there's a great deal that you can get. Uh, Chief Ramsey was the president of Major City Chiefs and uh, headed um, uh, PERF as well, and those two have great information, as, as does the BJA. Uh, they have a lot of information. BJA specifically on body-worn cameras, and that is incredibly expensive. I tell people that a pilot program is French for we don't have money for it. So um, it's, I mean, it is so expensive. It's just crazy. Right. So um, that, go, I would say go to those organizations because they have great information on you know, dealing with the uh, mental health, of just so many things that you need for your officers and your community. So, Denise, let's talk offline, but I can tell you what we've, um, what we've tried to do, not just with the city, but also with hospitals to address uh, those folks that are repeatedly showing up in emergency rooms around mental health crises. Can I ask for a show of hands? <clears throat> How many people are having difficulty recruiting police officers right now? Okay. We need more support. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, well, it sounds like it's a topic that we should address uh, sure. through this panel. Yes, just, just one last question. Um, Tito Brown, mayor of Youngstown, Ohio, uh, heard, heard you talking about registering for citizens, their cameras, and want to talk a little bit about more. I'm not sure if I got the $200 or $500 to spend, but uh, just how do you get the wet the appetite of the, the citizen to really get engaged? Because uh, for me, technology and camera systems are the direction I want to go in my community. And everybody's buying them, ring, you know, the doorbell, all that, and I just want to see how do we make it a systemic approach to the citizens. Well, I, one thing that, and we haven't found it that hard, um, although when you talk about 17,000, we have 700,000 people who live here. So a lot more people could have cameras who do. I think a lot of the early adopters in the program are already kind of tech leaning. Um, and so this is just another addition to the, some of the things that they're doing in their house, and this might have pushed them over the edge. I use my community affairs team um, that's in the mayor's office, but also all of the community affairs um, workers and all of our agencies. We have door knockers. Um, I do a monthly walk uh, in uh, across the across the city, and part of getting ready for that walk is either before or after the walk that we're door hanging in, in communities. Uh, that need cameras. Uh, we have friendly competitions among our communities, some of the, the community groups, or we have a volunteer um, a position called Advisory Neighborhood Commissioner. Um, and I make it a point when I go out to a community to say, hey, uh, Pin Branch, why does Bloomingdale have more cameras than you? Um, and people realize that this is a benefit that they can get from their tax dollars. And to leave it on the table is just leaving $500 on the table. Um, so why uh, don't uh, don't they participate? The, we do have an ask, and that is that they're registered with the police department. And if and only if there is a crime committed um, in that vicinity, would the police ask them to be able to look at the camera footage? I can find that on your website, the, yes. the information. Thank you so much, yes. Mayor. Appreciate can it. Yes, please. In Phoenix, we have a program we've called Virtual Block Watch, and we have asked people to sign up who already have cameras, so if you have a ring doorbell or CCTV, and that's been helpful to us. Uh, we try every time we have a success story to talk about how it's helped us. So we had a, a high profile uh, road rage incident where a young woman lost her life and we were able to find the perpetrator thanks to that camera footage and that helped us raise awareness that you using a camera you already have can help make Phoenix a safer city. Thank you, that's good. that's good. So I think our time is up. I want to thank um, all of our panelists. Great discussion um, and to be continued. Uh, thank you all very much.